Hello. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for <laughs> making your evening and spending it with us. Uh, my, as Mark said, my tortoise claim to fame or claim to tortoise fame is uh, the podcast they did, The Son of Afghanistan. But I've been thinking about whether I'm a son of Afghanistan or a son of Britain, because I was 12 when I left Afghanistan, and I've lived in Britain since November 2004. So does that make me an adopted son of Britain or a son of Britain or a son of Afghanistan? So that's a question that I've been thinking about and grappling with, which goes to the heart of where really home is. And I have been asked by my uh, soon to be 10 year old daughter, if, if there was a war between Afghanistan and Britain, who would you fight for? I have not really decided on that because the, the, the chance of Britain going to war with Afghanistan again is not, 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 not great. But the point is that for becoming a refugee, becoming displaced, it is a uniquely painful experience. It is nothing like you could experience ever. And for me, when I think of my own experience, I always go back to the image that I have of the last glance that I took to the village and looked back on the back of a motorbike just being tortured by the Taliban in the morning. And looking back, and every time I think about my own experiences, it's just that image that stays with me. And, and when I think of other refugees and other people who've been displaced, I always think about the image that they have in their minds about what is it that makes them think about home. Because, as I said, it's uniquely painful to, to and, and uniquely disorientating. It's not a one-off experience. It's a lived experience that will stay with you for the rest of your life. And as you've covered this, the stories of 31 amazing people, but in many ways, they are the lucky ones who've made it. You know, if you're lucky, you make it. I remember in 2001, uh, Around summer 2001, I was working at a, uh, at a con construction site in Iran. Uh, I was 14. And I was in this part of Iran where people who would want to move westward had to pass through. And one day we had this group of people arrive. And so, you know, the refugee communities, you're connected with each other. So they had found to, to, to rest with us. And among the people who were there, was a school friend of mine. His name was Razi. And he came and he told me while you know we were the same age, and he said, My father has sell, you know, has sold all the land he owned, and all the land he owned has become around one thousand five hundred dollars, the exact amount that he paid the people smugglers to get me to Europe. And he was asking me to beg around and make some money so I could make the journey with him as well. And of course, I had no chance of finding that money. He made the journey. And I remember hearing from somebody uh, two or three weeks later that he was in Istanbul. After leaving Istanbul, he and the boat that was carrying him in 2001 drowned in the Aegean Sea, never to be seen again. But I suppose when you look at refugees who've made it from one side of the world to another side, remember, these are the lucky ones. But these are the people with amazing experiences that we need to learn from them, listen to them, understand them. And given the world we live in, it is more than, it's, it's more important than ever that we listen to these stories. And you know, you've done a brilliant work um, on that. And I, I want you to talk about the stories that you've come across. And of course, you've gone beneath the, the, the human stories, but just delve deeper into what makes them think of themselves, of the experiences they've had, and the lives that they've left behind. Thank you, and thank you for sharing. To speak to what you just said, not everyone in this book has made it to their final host country or destination. And that was really important for me because over the years when I've been working in this space, I've met a lot of people in camps who have been in camps for a lot of time, many years, and who have said to me, well, what do people in the UK think about what is happening here? And it always was difficult for me to communicate that I didn't really think that many people in the UK had much insight into what was happening in camps along the journey. So it felt really important to include stories of people that were still 
on that journey mm. that hadn't made it to that final destination, that didn't feel like they were in that place where they could be safe, settle, start their new lives. Mm. There are several people that that are there. And one, well, two of them are on stage tonight, two very important people in this book. The first story uh, is a very important one for me. And to give you guys a little bit of context as to how this book came to be, it started eight years ago for me in 2015, when I was the oldest of four kids and my youngest brother was about to move out of home. He was 18 and my mum and dad were experiencing something I think that it's probably quite common at that point in their lives. They were feeling like, oh my God, we're gonna have no kids at home anymore. What are we gonna do? And empty nest syndrome, basically. So they started looking into their options for fostering or adoption. And they live in Kent in the south of the UK. And as they were going down this long, rigorous process of becoming foster parents, they came to learn that there were a lot of unaccompanied children a lot of minors arriving to the UK uh, via Kent, from Calais to Kent. Um, and there were a lot of foster families who didn't necessarily want to take on an older child or a boy or a child that didn't speak English. And my mum and dad felt like they'd had lots of experience with naughty teenagers and difficult... Uh, <laughs> they basically felt like they were up for, up for any challenge. And uh, so they decided that they were open to taking on what was referred to as an unaccompanied minor. And towards the end of that process, it took nine months. My mum always says it was a bit like a pregnancy. My mum had a dream. And in that dream, she saw, saw the face of a boy. And she described him as having a beautiful smile. And she woke up knowing that he was, she had a real sense that he was on his way, that he was coming. That Friday, they got accepted as foster parents. And that Sunday, we got a phone call. And I actually would love to read a tiny section from the book, if you guys are happy to bear with me as I, as I do. Um, that really gives a little bit of context as to how this all happened. So is that cool, Ro? Can I go yeah, for it? Yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so I remember the phone call. It was a Sunday morning in the summer of 2015 and I was having breakfast at my parents' house in Kent. My mum was half-heartedly flicking through the Sunday magazine that came with the paper, chatting to me about my week. When the home phone rang, it was my dad who ran to answer it, standing in front of the window in the dining room. He was backlit, but I could see the silhouette of him holding the phone between his ear and his shoulder, leaning across the dining table to grab a notepad and a pen. Meseret, he repeated, slowly and carefully writing the letters down onto the pad. M-E-S-E-R-E-T. My mum cast the magazine aside. Both of us sat up straighter, listening carefully. He's 12 years old, my dad repeated, nodding. From Eritrea, speaks no English. My mum and I exchanged an excited look, a mixture of, shit, is this really happening? And yes, it's finally happening. <laughs> It felt like ages before my dad put the phone down. That was Kent Social Services, he said, confirming what we already knew. They found a boy at the Folkestone Eurotunnel terminal. He had been hiding underneath the Eurotunnel train. He's from Eritrea, seems healthy apart from a knee injury, and he's probably hungry and tired. What do you guys think, he said, looking at my mum. That's him, she replied. That's him. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you. Mez, um, what I wanted to get from you is um, in, in April 2019, I, was, I went to Afghanistan for the first time after leaving the country, but I didn't manage to go to the village that I, I'd come from because the space between the capital and Kabul, uh, Kabul and our village was then controlled by the Taliban. But there's something of family connections that you have. Uh, one of my aunts, uh, I was in Kabul and a few of re uh, relatives came to Kabul. And one of my aunts, I didn't know that. 
sent me a bag, and I opened the bag, there's a, there's a bag full of earth. And when I spoke to him on the phone and he said, do you remember there was a tree that you planted, there's an apple tree that you planted, and this is the earth from the bottom of that, uh, that, that, that tree. It's always there, we remember this. We, every time it, it, you know, the spring comes, we say, this is a rose tree and we enjoy the fruits of it very much. But for me in my, my head, that, that earth represented the village that I had left. And I always think about this. Even my son, who's 15, um, he once asked me, do you think somewhere in the village there's a footstep you've left behind that's remained untouched? And for all of us, there's somewhere in our village or in our city or in our town, a footstep that's been remained untouched. And it, it, it'd be the same for you as I imagined the last picture of the village that I remember. What, I, what is the last image that you remember of your own home? That's a very good question. Um... The last image was I was um, like uh, I finished work, and um, it was in the weekend. So like Sundays, I worked for a little bit, and then after five or six o'clock, I hung out with my friends and stuff. And I was looking uh, looking forward to do that when I was working. When I finished work, and uh, I let go the donkeys and the cart and um, my friend were waiting for me and uh, we always gather around in one place and we stayed the whole evening just chatting laughing and just being teenagers um, and before we could do that um, just when I was about to take my work clothes the military came and when you see them coming either you have to disappear from the um, place because if they take you, you're not coming back for mm. a long time. So we, we've we been doing this for a long time. When, they, when we see them come, we just run away and come back. We run away and come back, we hide and stuff. And um, But that night was uh, different. They came and only three of us from all the group got together and then we just ran away. Mm. We didn't know where we were going. We didn't know where we we're going to end up. We just start running. And then without us knowing, we ended up on completely different town. And um, because we thought they were following us all the way and uh, there were gunshots and everything. And the only thing I can remember um, leaving was just like some of us were trying to join the group was there and there were already some groups there as well. So I can remember just all the group were just mm, going off, away. yeah, go in everywhere. And um, yeah, that's the last image that I can always just remember and never forget because what would happen if we just stayed that night? Would I be here <clears throat> or would anything happen that night, uh, if the military service didn't come that night. So that is always in my mind. So when you think of home, that is the image that you remember of the, 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 the village. And I, I, I see that, the, you know, he, he mentioned uh, he mentioned the donkey. Uh, we, uh, one of my, my uncles had a donkey and he really once beat me up because I apparently broke the back of his donkey by you know, overloading it. And every uh -huh. time I call him now, he says, do you remember the donkey? And I say, yes, but you haven't sent me the money for it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so we all have this small snippets of things that reminds us of home. And I, I, whether it's, just, it's, a, it's a piece of uh, reminders that you get from your, your, your home. Um, I remember somebody came from uh, Afghanistan some time ago, and one of my relatives sent me this. It's a, it's a prayer bit, but what we used to do in the village was people used to gather in the mosque in, in the evenings, and all men would have one of these, and whose was the prettiest and whose was the, the most expensive, and they would exchange each other this one. And for a lot of people, this was the, the priciest asset that they had at that time. And I suppose 
I carry this with me all along. And, and it, it's just that, small things that reminds you there is somewhere that you once called home. But we all in the same way, all of us is disorientated, but for to be forcefully forced out of your home, and it's an entirely different experience. And that's why I mentioned the image that you that lives in your head of the last moments in your village. And I, you know, I, I just pass it on to you to talk about the last image of your home. Sure. I think the last image of my home, uh, I actually was displaced from my home by the conflict, which is internal. And before I left uh, the place that the conflict displaced me into, which really has a terrible memory. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in, uh, in a small town uh, in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. I can describe it as a beautiful town with, uh, you know, magnificent landscape. And all I remember is uh, the beautiful nature, the trees and the river Nile that we used to swim in and play with, with my little friends by then. And, you know, and the love of uh, my family and my siblings and the people around me so it is something that uh, I always remember. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that memory uh, or that image that I took when I was younger, uh, it was ripped away from my mind before I even left the country. Because uh, with all these memories, and then a conflict broke out that affect me personally and affect the society that I come from. And it uh, <clears throat> led me into a situation where I was forced by the conflict uh, to leave my home and run into a UN compound to seek for protection. So that mean, although I was still in my country that I call my homeland, uh, I was still being displaced from my beautiful memories into a terrible memories within. So all I can say is, uh, the memory that I had when I left the country of my origin or the country that I call my homeland, it was a terrible memory. So it was a memory of a camp. It was a memory of seeing a small fence where a thousand of people live inside. Uh, it was a memory of seeing children who seek for education, but they can't find it. It is a memory where I would love to play football with my friends, but there is no space. It is a memory where I see myself being targeted and being suppressed to live in a small environment by people whom I believe that we share a common nation together, whom I could call brothers and sisters. And it is a terrible memory. Uh, to be honest. So, yeah, it's a terrible memory. Thank you. And thank you so much for sharing that. It's, it's, it's incredible. I'm so brave of you to, to, you know, to, to say it so bravely. And you've written a poem as well. Sure. And would you want to read it for us? Yeah, sure. <sighs> Let me find you the page. Okay. <laughs> Here you go. Maybe you want to give a bit of context yeah, to your yeah. story before sure. you do. Yeah. I actually uh, wrote this poem. Uh, it was, I think it was uh, four months or five months ago. Uh, I wrote it out of things that affect me personally and affect so many people and in which some of them uh, have died, have drowned in the sea, in which some of them were killed by smugglers, uh, in which two, uh, some of them were killed uh, by a people whom I believe, as I told you, uh, that we share the same country or the same 
uh, flag with with. And before I read the poem, I can give you a little bit of my story and my journey uh, to the UK. Uh, well, it happened in 2013. Uh, when I was young, uh, when I was nine or 10 in age, uh, in South Sudan, in a capital called Juba, which is the capital of South Sudan. Uh, in the morning, I woke up, and all I can hear were gunshots, were screaming of people in the street. And I asked my father, what is happening? And I told him that uh, is the war ending? And then he told me, no, the war was not ending, but there are gunshots and people are fighting. Uh, that war, it leads into ethnic cleansing, in which that society I belongs to, they target them door to door, they hunt them and killing them because of their demographic uh, identity. Uh, we had to escape our home and run into the UN compound in Juba, which is the United Nations mission in South Sudan. Uh, on our way to the UN, we had to be stopped and scrutinize whether we are near, which is a society that I belongs, or we are not. And then we had to survive because we deny the fact that we are not near. So within that genocide, thousands of people were killed within just a speak of two weeks in which my father became a victim of that genocide. So following that genocide, it turns into a civil war that destroyed and left the country fragile until the moment we are talking. Uh, we had to escape into the UN camp and I stayed there. It was quite a rough life. So the same people who, who killed and committed genocide against those particular society or community were still following them, climbing the building nearest to the UN compound and shooting them with the snipers inside. And yeah, it took uh, quite some time. And I stayed there in, the, in that camp for five years. After that, uh, I was frustrated. Uh, I love school. I love peaceful life. Uh, I was a young boy. I love to be free, not to be just locked in that camp. And I stayed there for all my life, as people are still in the camp right now, we are talking. And my mother and my sibling, they are in the camp right now. So we sneak with my friends one day in the afternoon, and we escape the camp. When we escape the camp, we cross the country, we cross the border into uh, another country where we were sold into slavery. Uh, and I have never met those friends again. I don't know whether they are alive or they are dead, only God knows. So I had to be sold alone and I was sold to Libya. So where I was imprisoned and being beaten every day, given a phone to call your family and pay for your money and free yourself. So I had no one to call. And then I had to be bailed out, uh, someone paid a ransom has a bondage and then I had to go and walk for them. Uh, they forced me to walk and get them back their money that they used to, 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 to bail me out from jail with. And then uh, I had to escape. Uh, I planned escape and then I went and met uh, some Sudanese people whom I stay with and until uh, we had a planning to cross the sea and come to Europe. So uh, the journey was terrible. We went into the sea. Unfortunately, we didn't make it. And half of the people inside our boat died and we survived. I was one among the survivors. And we were taken back to Libya by smugglers who roam around the sea looking for people to confiscate their boats and ask for ransom. Uh, we were in a prison again. It's the same life of prison that I was before. So it was terrible uh, until we had to plan a break 
and escape because the life was tough. You can see someone has stayed in prison for like a year, seven months, six months. And you can only see bones, not humans, only with the spirit uh, because the terrible condition in prison. And some people, you get them with limbs broken, arm broken, ribs broken, teeth broken, and everything uh, because of torture they go through. So we can't take that situation anymore. We had to break. So we wait for them when they come in the evening, getting us the food, which is uh, pasta with water and salt once a day. And with one plate, uh, 10 to 11 or 12 people, if you get one bite, you're lucky. If you're not lucky, and then you wait until tomorrow for the other bite. And then, yeah, we said we can't take it anymore. I was the youngest. Uh, and we planned a break. We said that we had to attack them the moment they come and open the door and try to give us the food. We would attack them. And if we die, we die at once. We can't keep dying every day. And then uh, we planned it. So the moment they opened the door, and then we had to pull the door and push them out and attack them. So luckily, we had the ability to disarm their guns. And the case fall down in front of me while the older guys were fighting and engaging in disarming their guns. And then I took the keys and opened all the doors where prisoners are. And all of us, we come out and we break the big, the huge gate. And then we all set ourselves free. So that is how I escaped that prison and planned my journey. And I arrived into Europe. And now I'm speaking to you in the UK. Thank you. So after I arrived here uh, last year, I met Jess, and she was an amazing person. And I'm proud to have met you. And I wrote this poem, and she included my story in her book. They were actually 30, but when she heard about my story, uh, she said, yeah, I have to include it and make it like one. You can imagine, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, the poem, the title is Kindness and Empathy. It says, if there is anything I can do in this world is to be kind, is to be kind to those who have wronged me and to those I have wronged, is to be kind to those who have killed my family and friends, is to be kind to those who sold me in bondage, is to be kind to those who jailed me arbitrarily and starved me, is to be kind to those who beat me and tortured me, because it is only through kindness that we can make a difference in the world. And empathy help us understand each other's situation better. Have empathy toward others. Put yourself in their shoes before you judge them. Through empathy, we can bear kindness and make the world a better place to live in. Thank you so much for I, I have no words to express the incredible way that you managed to tell the story. Um, it's such a such an honour to to be sitting here and listening to your story. Uh, but I think we should open to uh, to the audience and take questions that they may have about what they what they've heard, um, and then we'll we'll move. And we've got microphone, uh, so. Hands up, if. Hello. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Kat. I, I work here at Sorters. Thank you both and all for coming here and, and sharing your amazing stories. They are really incredible and, and unbelievable almost, but clearly not. Um, my question really is, I suppose, kind of how do you kind of, after going through the situations that you have gone through, write yourself and put together a plan of what you do next? Or is it accidental? Um, was there ever a thought that you wanted to 
come to England? And if so, why? Or was that accidental? And would you ever see England as becoming your home? Um, I think for, for me, it's a bit different to, to these guys because uh, my father came here first and he was an anti-Taliban commander. You know, because of that, we were being persecuted um, and, you know, I was, I was held uh, captive by the Taliban. I was in Iran when I found out that my father, in 2001, when I found out that my father was alive and he claimed asylum in the UK. I remember the first time we spoke, um, I had been past a, a number that I didn't know where it was from. Uh, because, you know, any refugee communities, wherever you are, you'll have, you know, points of contacts. And in Iran, we had, uh, we had somebody who was the point of contact for everybody from the village that I, we, we came from. I used to call them sometimes to say, have you had anything from the village or, you know, a letters come through. I remember I had a, I, I called him after three months and it was just before or after 9-11. And, and he said, oh, there's someone called and left this number. And I remember looking at the number is 0044 and I, I had no idea what it was. But while I was in Iran, when I came from Afghanistan, I could read and write. So we speak Persian, the, you know, the same language spoken in in, in Afghanistan. And I used, I used to read a lot, and I was a football mad. I used to, you know, the construction sites we used to work, some building materials used to, used to come and pack in old magazines and newspapers. And sometimes I used to use my wages to, to buy, uh, you know, pieces of newspaper, especially the sports pages. And I called this number, and it was early in the morning, midday, you know, 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. In, in, in Iran, and it was some, some, sometime at dawn in, in, in in Britain, and I instinctively, you know, recognized this was my father, and he's alive. I didn't know he was he was alive or dead for two years, for over two years, um, and we started joking, laughing, and he was crying from he, this end, and I was laughing from that end, and he said, w "I said, where are you?" He said, "I'm in Manchester, somewhere outside Manchester," but I knew about Manchester because of Manchester United. <laughs> Uh, because I was reading in sports pages of the Iranian newspapers and media, I remember reading a piece, a, a, a gossip piece about Manchester United, and it was about David Beckham and Victoria Beckham. So the piece said, Vic David Beckham is married to Victoria Beckham, who's, who does not trust David, and they've got a son who's called Brooklyn, and that Victoria follows David during his night outs, and she never smiles. So I, 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 I thought that smile bit was correct, but the rest of it, I, I don't know. So I, I spoke to my father and he said, look, I'm in Britain. I've not been to Manchester United because I don't have the money. And his instruction to me was, you can go back to Pakistan, join the rest of the family and come to Britain. Uh, so it took us about four years for us to, to get here. And even then, when you arrive, having had that adrenaline of running away from things, is you cannot describe, you know, especially if you're a child, you have to be running away from everything around you. And it's only then, once the adrenaline settles, that you begin to realize what you've been through. And that is where you're the most vulnerable. You know, you've run around, you've, you know, the, the survival mode you've been through you do not recognize at that moment that you, I mean, I remember we were being uh, smuggled from Pakistan uh, to Iran and the Iranian border force were firing at us because the people smugglers, anywhere you go, as, as he so eloquently said, they're there to use you. And we were being used, I, I, was, I was 12, uh, just, just 13. We were being used as drug mules. So all night we walked the you know Iranian Pakistan border mountains with you know bags of heroin or whatever it was on our on our shoulders on our backs and we walked and being fired at. So you look around you, everybody's out there to take advantage of you, and when you realize once you've settled and you're in a peaceful place, you begin another war and that war within you that is the most unsettling I've experienced. And without having the right support mechanism, you'll struggle. And I have been through that struggle. I'm sure it's, you know, everybody has been. And that is 
it takes time for you to adjust and then begin to realize where is home. And it's, it's difficult to find an answer to. And it takes time because the adrenaline settled. You're in a peaceful, in a sense, physically peaceful place. But emotionally, you're the most vulnerable. So I, you know, I wanted to ask you, Jazz, about your experience of just this sense of you know peacefulness and also this unsettling and disorientating experience. Yeah, well, I want to hand that over to these two. But in answer to your question, Mez is the first foster brother that we have in our family. Mez from Eritrea, and then we have a Sudanese, an Afghan, and a Libyan foster brother. And I don't think any of you had a plan to come to the UK, right? I didn't. I did not have a plan to come to the UK. Um, Throughout my whole journey, I didn't even know where I was going. I was following people that were going somewhere, especially the friends that I was with. So, okay, we're going to this, and then we go to that. We're going to this, we go to that. Especially when I arrived in Italy after the horrible journey that I experienced in the Mediterranean Sea, we arrived in Italy, and they separated us as overage and underage. And obviously, I went through the underage ones and they took us to um, a little uh, campsite that they had. And um, for my first um, first insp like um, thought was like, okay, I'm safe, I'm gonna stay here. I'm not going anywhere. And then we stayed there for like two weeks there and the people that stayed there for like five, six years, um, it's like, oh, you can't study here, you can't um, work or you can't call your family, you can't do anything. The first thing I want to do is call my mom, tell her that I'm safe. She haven't heard from me for the past six, seven months. And I want to call her, but I couldn't. So I was like, okay, where do we need to go? So they tell us, you need to go to Rome, and then maybe from Rome you can call her. We arrived in Rome again, and in Rome was just same people as us, and they have no resources for us to call home. And it's like, okay, what do we do? And and then all of a sudden, I found a, um, two um, friend of mine from back home. I don't know how they arrived there, but they took the horrible journey as me. And they were saying, OK, we're going to France. Do you want to come with us? And I was like, I've got nothing to do here, so I'll come with you. We came to France, and then I arrived in Calais. Calais was horrible. It reminded me the first camp of Ethiopia when I arrived in. So it was similar. It was muddy, it was cold. Horrendous, horrendous place. I, and but the people inside that camp were lovely. I've never met people from so different like countries, and so lovely. And they try to help you as much as they can and uh, welcome you. They have nothing. They wait for the people that the voluntary to give them some food and clothes and stuff. But they share that with you. And um, anyway, I stu I stuck with the friends that I came with, and we tried to come to the UK. And I arrived in the UK, like uh, we just said in the uh, little introduction, they, I arrived in this uh, police station and they asked me, do you want to be with family or do you want to be with a shared uh, accommodation? And my first instinct was like, I want to be with family. I lost my family, so um, I want to build that relationship again. And but I thought my first, um, when I thought of family, they're gonna send me to Eritrean family, not to English family. I had no idea what family I was going into. <laughs> so I was like, I want to go back to the Eritrean family so I can feel like I live with Eritrean family. Then they just put me in a taxi and sent me to um, my dad's house. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> I had no interpreter, no, no explanation of where I was going. They literally just put me in a taxi and I arrived in that, um, at home. And, um, and when you say they, who was they? I don't know. So they called the social services and stuff, like what Jazz explained. So obviously dad said, um, okay, we want this 13, 12 year old boy from Eritrea. We accept him. He spoke to the social services and Somehow, when I said I wanted to be with family, they just put me in that taxi from the police station, and I arrived in Kent. So, and then I arrived <laughs> in that place, 
They opened the door, everyone was so excited to see me as they have <laughs> known me before. And I was like, who's these people? <laughs> you know? Uh, I, t I don't know how to explain myself, but like, I was just out of it. And, uh, Sorry, I don't have the mic, but how did you communicate if you couldn't speak? I couldn't, I couldn't and communicate. So, but... Mayor speaks to Grinya which was not on Google Translate at the time. So, it's not, still not. <laughs> so somehow we did. I really remember like actually not having a communication problem. And I remember yeah. telling something that you told me to one of my other mates and they were like, but did he tell you that? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, but how? <laughs> and I didn't, I don't, I don't know how to explain in words, but like somehow we communicated and we drew pictures and we, yeah, the first few days, like you were saying uh, um, earlier, is so unsettling. You don't settle quickly um, when you arrive. And I thought they were going to do the same thing that they did in the police station. So it stayed there for like a few hours and then let you go somewhere. And But then I stayed, I slept with my whole clothes, with my shoes on and everything because I was on the go. For the past whole year, I was moving, 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 no rest. And mom trying to explain to me, like, you can relax, like, this is your house. But the language barrier was there. I was like, okay, I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I had the um, full of, like, uh, beanbag, wet clothes, because before I arrived to the UK, I was in a um, river and stuff like that. And mom didn't know what it was. And I couldn't explain to, uh, to her. And she was like, can I see it? And so said, like, yeah, go and see it. And she found, like, just wet clothes. and my clothes that I wear beforehand. And then after a few days, I, they sent me a, a social worker and a translator after a week or so. Mm -hmm. And that, that week was a horrible week for me. Even though I felt like I, I can sleep, I didn't sleep because something in my head is like, oh, something is here. So I literally get up and then I move downstairs and something, mom wakes up and then brings me back to bed. And it was horrible. And then when I have this uh, social worker came with the translator, it's like, do you want to stay here or do you want to go somewhere? Are you happy here? I was like, yeah, I want to stay here. Um, I don't want to go anywhere else now. Mm -hmm. And that is the best decision I have made in my whole life. Okay. In my whole life. <laughs> I, I remember our first day, we, we landed at Manchester Airport and I always remember the first picture of the new country. It was this immigration officer uh, looking at us and my uh, siblings as well. And he was so gentle, so kind, you know, unlike anyone we'd experienced before. And his first words were, he just looked at our passports and in the travel documents that we were provided, stamped it, welcome to Britain. I remember that welcome to Britain bit very clearly. And then because we didn't know where to go, you know, entirely new to one place where we didn't understand, he came off his chair and directed us to, to find uh, people waiting outside for us. We went to Wolverhampton. It was dark evening, rainy, and all crammed into this one bedroom flat. And I'm, l I'm looking down from the window in the street, it's full of children all teenagers running around, you know, one of those little uh, loud motorbikes making loud noises. And because it was November, I didn't know. And there are firecrackers were going. Mm. And I'm looking down with all the fire, 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 fireworks going. I was like, is this peace? <laughs> you know, have I left Afghanistan to this place? Is it going to be like this every day? So, yeah, I just leave it to you to... You told me that story too on New Year's Eve, didn't you? That you yeah. had the same experience. Yeah. Um, I think... I would um, say that it is Well, I don't have an answer for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, so I, I had a question which was, I guess, specifically, uh, specifically for Giao and, and Mez, since you've been sort of set up life here more recently. Have you managed to find something here in the UK that kind of connects you with where you've come from? It might be, I don't know, a restaurant, a bar, a song, just something like, have you found a sort of connection to home while you're here or is, I, I was, yeah. Or maybe, I don't know, a brand of soft drink or, or something like. When I arrived here, um... I didn't know how, like, if we had any Eritrean community or anything, and especially where we're living at the moment in Kent, there's not many Eritrean. Um, so my first thought was, like, if I go to church, I'll probably meet some Eritrean there. And I asked Dad, like, I want to go to church. And he took me to um, a Catholic church just... Uh, around the corner from our house, and it was completely different to... <laughs> <laughs> you walk shot. in with your shoes on, um, <laughs> you do completely different um, ceremony to what we do. And um, I said to my dad, like, this is, this is not um, like... <laughs> this is not what the church yeah, looked like. Yeah, yeah, it's not what I grew up with. And he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. But he had no idea. He had, I, I, now when I understand, he had... He, you just thought church is church. Yeah. And then he was like, okay, when we came back, we didn't come back from that, he searched any Eritrean um, church around here. There was none, so he came um, then, but there was one in London. He came, and then he brought me to that one, and all of a sudden, there was just a bunch of a lot of Eritrean people and the ceremony, and even when I just hear the noise that from the church brings me back straight to home and the memory that um, every day or every Sunday that I used to hear um, walking back to school or and just the memory just bring me back and all the ladies with a white dress and yeah and that special that that day was very special to me because it bring me back home and um, I remember my mom wearing going wearing all white and going to church and after that after like I went the first time and then the second time we went with my dad um, and then the third time I went back there again and I found one of my best friends now that he did the same journey as me and then since then I just going to that church and when you when you just walk around or just come out from Kent you find a lot of um, restaurant, pubs, uh, people, uh, then you feel like, okay, there's some Eritrean people in here so I can have like uh, friends and stuff like that. So yeah, I found a little community when after I came to London. Uh, yeah, I think there is one thing that, uh, that I found and it really makes me happy and remember back home. Yeah, it was, um, it was last year here in London, in Paddington. And um, I used to stay with my friends in, uh, in Tottenham. <laughs> and then he told me that I found a Sudanese restaurant. So with um, a Sudanese food is famous, it's called Kisra. And then they eat it with uh, like a soup, an okra soup or like some kind of uh, traditional foods. And then I told him that, no man, you're joking. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm serious, let's go. And then we went. So we took like uh, two trains and then to Paddington from Tottenham. And um, when we arrived, I couldn't believe my eyes. So I saw the food and I saw the soup and I saw everything there. And then, yeah, so I felt like there is something at least which is here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it was uh, really great. And another thing was um, I met uh, South Sudanese and uh, New York community in particular. So we there is a South Sudanese community here in the in the UK in London, uh, with uh, people from the same uh, uh, society who speak the same language, and they come together sometime and you know have a party and organize like a, an occasion and a night out. So which really feel uh, amazing. So and 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 it feels good when I. Uh, realize that um, 
in this diverse country. Uh, so, you know, I can find people that uh, can speak the same language as me and we can get together and, you know, remember all the things that I have forgotten a long time ago. So, yeah, it's really uh, pleasing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Indeed. Mark tell us, we, uh, you know, taking over the next session's time. Yeah, but if you could. Yeah, so if, if, <laughs> if we're going to wrap it up, but, you know, overall, I think, you know, as you heard, refugee stories are human stories, and they affect not just the individual who's been displaced, but, you know, affect communities of people in whichever way they're connected to that person. So, as, as you said, you know, the way he's affected your life, and it's exactly true for, for us all, for you all. And uh, we have to always remember that home is where you are looked after, I suppose. But in your, in your mind, you've always left something behind that, whether you find it in food, in music, in, in my case, a piece of earth that was left there under a tree. Um, but yes. It's all human stories, and we all have a home somewhere. But I'll leave you to ja the, to you to to finish the the panel or the discussion. Say so the last. I words. just want to add one more thing about home uh, that I find um, very amusing in here. When I arrived here, like I said earlier, I didn't know uh, about this English family. I had none. I have. I couldn't speak English at all. Couldn't communicate. But the patience and the, like the, the, yeah, the patience that my mom have, like I call her my mom now. I don't have any, like I call my mom back at home, mom. I, I call my mom here at mom. It's the same thing to me. They bring me up the same way. My mom bought me as like her son, uh, probably to be the best son ever. And my mom here do the same thing. And when we had this language barrier, a lot of people get scared, like, oh, we don't want to uh, take this refugee to come to us because we can't speak to them, uh, can't speak to us, and so we're going to be very hard to communicate with them, blah, blah, blah. My mom had very simple ideas and very simple way of showing me things. So she, for example, she just she, um, had a lot of stickers on the house. She labeled all the things like fridge, carrot, apple, banana, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. she labels everything. And then when I know what that word is, she takes it off. So that's as easy as that to, so you don't have to feel under pressure and scared to welcome someone that doesn't speak the same language as you. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it can be as easy as that. And she sits down with me, she speaks to me, even though I don't understand, she just carry on speak to me. I go to on a dog walk with her and ask me about her my day and I struggle but I still speak. That way we just made this unbreakable bond that we have with this family now. Um, this family, I hate calling them my foster family. I, I can't even say it. I call them my family. They are my family. Because they show me the same love as they show their kids. And I see that in some other families they try to separate them. They see their kids differently and the foster kids differently. But if they just see us the same way and make this um, bond and there's no fear of accepting other refugees to your home or to your anything around you. Yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, um, it's not as hard as you think. That's what I'm trying to say. So on that note, thank you all so much. Thanks for watching that video. If you enjoyed that, we think you'll love these. And if you want to join us for the next live recording of Tortoise Lates, head to tortoisemedia.com forward slash book.